Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy Wright, and you're watching one of Bandology's interview series. I'm the education manager, and today I have the wonderful pleasure of talking to Mark Hopkins, a conductor and professor at Acadia University, and so much more, and he's here to tell us all about that. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I am enjoying a weird moment of warmth in the uh, winter weather that we have here in Southern Ontario. Um, so could you tell us just a little bit about like what you do? Um, yeah. Um, I am hired at Acadia University as a, as a professor of instrumental music. And the fun thing about that title was I got to sort of shape the job in the direction I wanted to shape it in. So um, I'm responsible for overseeing the music education side of things here. But um, aside from my first degree, all of my other degrees are in performance. So I also have a role in the performance aspects of the school, teaching, conducting, and uh, leading ensembles. So it's kind of a perfect mix. mix. I, um, I love teaching just about as much as I love performing. So the two of them really blend well together here. That's, uh, sounds like a really diverse, like broad portfolio in some ways as an educator. Um, but it sounds, but uh, it's nice. It's cool that it gets to be like fulfilling for both the things that you enjoy. Cause that balance is something I find like is always a challenge to strike. It's like, these are all the things I like, I want to do them all. Um, so that's cool to hear that that's sort of a, um, thing that's manifested in your career, but I want to take it back a little bit further, uh, a while further, probably, uh, considering you uh, are a professor, when was the first time you picked up an instrument? When was your sort of first step into the music education performing journey? Well, I want you to think back to the Cro-Magnum period, you know, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And sorry, I can't resist because it's it's a long time. Um, but it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about it lately. Um, I have kids, they're both off doing different exciting things, and um, there's an interesting moment in every kid's life where the switch is flipped, where there's a musical understanding that, and a hunger, I think, that almost becomes a part of what they do. And in my case, it was flipped very early through church music. I uh, sang in Anglican church choir since I could walk, um, and uh, from like the age of five or six, spent summers at the Toronto Diocesan Boys Choir School in Port Hope, Ontario. And uh, I didn't, I thought everybody sang in parts when I was a kid. I didn't know any better. So when I think about it now, when I, when I reflect on it, it was a very fortunate thing because that switch for audiation, for, for hearing and seeing was, was turned on very early. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, but in terms of instruments, uh, I was started by a French horn player from the, uh, the Toronto Symphony who was doing an itinerant job in Scarborough. His name is Miles Hearn. And he actually started me on French horn um, when I was in grade four or five, but I, I didn't like playing off beats. I wanted the melody, so I switched over to trumpet somewhere along the way. So I had a very early start in the Scarborough school system. That's great, um, especially the fact that you had the opportunity to sort of engage with that at such a young age from sort of like a couple different directions. Um, I think that's, that's an opportunity that I wish more people had to like see both sides. Cause I know uh, when I was in university, there is a sort of like cultural divide between people who have grown up singing in church and people who have like grown up playing instruments or doing stuff because there's not a ton of overlap between those two things um, as much as you would expect maybe from generally musical people. So that's really cool um, to hear that. So what from those sort of like early experiences and that sort of broad based start did you go oh actually i i'd like to do this i'd like to was there was there a moment or was it sort of this sort of continuous like re, like oh this is my life and this is the thing and it's just what i have to do kind of thing well you know i know bandology is is engaged in running music camps and i gotta say scarborough music camp kind of solidified everything and the scarborough schools orchestras um orchestra it was under the direction of a guy named Don Coakley, one of the, the first people who wrote uh, original Canadian music for wind band and did it in a systematic way, especially for young groups. I got to play on world premieres of a lot of 
really standard pieces. Um, I don't want to admit how many of them are really old now, <laughs> but at the same time, it was it was exciting being in his orchestra. And you ask if there was a moment, but there were a number of moments, but one of the ones that sticks in my mind is when we played Sibelius Symphony Number no. 2 when I was in like grade 10, I think. And trumpet in E on a B-flat trumpet, not a good time. But the moment when you come in in the last moment with, with the big heraldic call, I just remember sort of looking around going, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. I, I think I could live in this pretty easily. And I, 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 to this day, Don is a mentor. Um, we talk regularly. And uh, looking up at him at the podium thinking, well, how did he get to do that? I think that was kind of the start of a lot of my thinking about, about being a musician. That's awesome, especially that you still have a relationship with someone from that like formative moment. Sibelius is one of my favorites, so I'm glad that, that was the thing that you I from the Cro Magnum like, period, as I said, you know, yeah. like that that period before the Ice Age. Prehistory. Yeah. Um there's a I think he's one of my favorites, so it's always nice to hear him uh shout it out, uh generally. But also it's cool that you had that sort of like early guide towards sort of this music career and we're able to look up and then build a relationship with um, Don. So could you tell me a little bit about uh, that sort of like how he helped or any other major influences or mentors sort of through your career up to that, uh, up to the point at which you became a mentor or even beyond? Um, well, in thinking about it, I was also lucky in the last couple of years of high school to play in the Toronto Symphony Youth Orchestra under Victor Felbro. And through Scarborough Symphony, Elaine Sargas, one of the string teachers, introduced me to Larry Weeks, who is principal trumpet of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. So from grade 11 on, I was studying with Larry, and I kept studying with Larry into my undergraduate years at University of Toronto. And then partway through, made a switch and worked with Steve Chenette at, at University of Toronto in his trumpet studio. And it's funny. Um, I say that I, I, I feel equally at home as a teacher, in, in teacher writ large, as a music educator, and as a musical performer. Um, originally, going into music education was a compromise with my engineer uh, father, who, um, you know, uh, has an MBA and, and did all those things, but, um, but wanted to be sure I would actually have something to quote unquote fall back on and uh, to be perfectly honest I, I, the two never they don't seem different to me they seem like they are different aspects of the same topic which is always about musicking about taking something and trying to trying to take something inanimate and breathe life into it trying to make something more beautiful through the process of teaching and more understandable so um, I feel like all of us who uh, who conduct, when we walk into a group we've never met before, even if it's a room full of professionals, um, we are in some aspect of, of our job teaching at, while we're performing. And I feel like the same is true when you're when you're doing more teaching to an elementary school class. It is still about musicking. It's still about making music in, in the moment. Yeah, I think that's a lot of the teachers that I've spoken to have had that sort of same thing where it's like it's too it's at the end of the day, music is coming out and it's just two ways of talking about it and two ways of engaging it. My clarinet teacher in university used to say teaching kept him honest um, because he, if he lectured us on something, that meant he had to go do it. Um, and that's something that's held through in my teaching. And that's sort of the aspect of like, at the end of the day, you're sort of expressing musically to the same thing, um, but just in two very different directions. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting because you've had that sort of like more uh, both things happening simultaneously and had that sort of education and then moved into sort of a performance focus and now we're doing like both educationally. Um, what are some career highlights? And that doesn't obviously have to be you conducting something, but can also be just experiences you've had as an educator. Um, so many, honest to God, so many highlights. Um, I loved every job I had more than just about anything else going on. Right out of uh, my Bachelor of Ed from Western, I, uh, I got a job at Milton District High School, which I had so much fun working with those, those people. It was, it, was, um, it was the place where I think I really learned that this was a really good fit for my personality. 
And interestingly enough, at the same time, I, I became principal trumpet of the Mississauga Symphony. So I was living, once again, that dual life of being out playing at night and being in school at 7 a.m. and running a rehearsal the next day. And it, it felt great. It, it fit everything I was doing. Um, highlights, all kinds of them. Taking uh, Milton District High School ensembles to festivals, taking Oakville Trafalgar High School to play in the New Orleans Heritage and Jazz Festival, taking the Upper Canada College Wind Ensemble on tour in, in Tokyo and, and uh, mainland China and Hong Kong, recording a CD at Upper Canada College, like those, and commissioning new works at all those schools at the same time, like my mentors had shown me like that, that they did. Um, it, was, it was just fantastic. And, and so for, from teaching standpoint, I had 13 years working with high school students that I loved more than anything. And uh, I left high school teaching with, with, with sort of trepidation, only because um, I, I really did have something that fit me and suited me. So people were, well, once again, my father was saying, why do you keep on getting these perfectly good jobs and quitting and moving somewhere else? And I have no really good answer for that, except um, I felt like uh, I'd watched people like Don Coakley and next was Wayne Jeffrey, who was another, another really important mentor. Uh, for a time when I was teaching high school and I and I thought well if they're doing that maybe I could do that too basically it just kept on coming back to watching these folks who I really admired and trying to emulate some of the things they were doing that's awesome that sort of there's a little bit of courage to like make those decisions of like going oh I'm going into the next thing it's because it's risky to like do career pivots generally and music is full of career pivots um is the thing it that is. I've learned through these conversations um but uh, so it's good that you had that sort of, it was cool. It's cool to hear that you had like role models and you're like, oh, I can do that. Like that's, that's the next, that's something I can do. Or I really I shouldn't have said that when I think about it, Sandy, I really shouldn't. I mean, I really didn't. I, I don't, I don't feel like, um, like there, there's no wunderkind here. There's, there's only someone who figured out how to work really hard. That's basically what I what I learned from all the people I really admired was, if you if you really want to make something go, you have to just work at it, and you have to be relentless. Um, so while I was playing the Mississauga Symphony, every once in a while I'd get asked to jump up and conduct something, because I was the music ed guy, I knew how to do four four time, and they'd put yeah, me yeah. in front of the brass ensemble or whatever, and I started to like it. So uh, I went to a conducting workshop that a whole bunch of university people who teach in Canada right now went to at the University of Calgary. It was a summer conducting wind diploma program. And that was maybe 10 years into my teaching career in high school. And that pretty much flipped a new switch. It kind of changed everything because I met there people like, well, Jessica Kuhn was one of the people who was a part of that program at one point in time. Angela Schrader at University of Alberta, Colleen Richardson at um, Western University, uh, Jill McKay at University of Toronto. We all sort of met in this one place and it was like summer camp for conductors. And um, they were all coming from different places, but, but Colleen and I really hit it off because we were both teaching high school. We both wanted to do more with our groups than we were doing. And this was like a place where we were being handed keys to understanding better repertoire, better programming, better musicianship, and, and developing that within our groups. And it seemed to run naturally towards the next steps for me, which were going to University of Calgary and getting a, uh, a master's degree in conducting and trumpet performance. And then eventually coming back and deciding that I would try out, seeing if I could win one of the 17 positions or 18 positions there are in the country for someone with the job like I have, which is pretty long odds. <laughs> it felt like it at the time, but, um, you know, I had a I had a health scare along the way there, which kind of I think gave me courage. You know, and that you mentioned that, and and I was I, I think about that sometimes too. I think if you realize that there's a limited amount of time where you're going to get to do the things you really want to do, it's time to go. There's there's no waiting. You know, and if you're not sure, 
then you better find out. And that, that was kind of what has led me to all the different places. 13 different moves over a couple of decades trying to figure out where to be to do the work that I really wanted to do, which has turned out to be at Acadia University. As a person at the very beginning of that journey, that's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, that they're they're uh, uh, it's a confidence boosting thing to hear. Um, but that's really it, cool. A to learn that a bunch of people that I know of and or have known uh, met uh, randomly at a summer camp um, as adults. <laughs> well, it wasn't a summer camp. It was a diploma pro, but it basically felt like music yeah. camp for adult conductors. And we ran all over Calgary and we're just yeah, no. going to stampedes. and. But having those like joint, that sort of community experience, I think has always been um, a really valuable thing in music um, for me. And I know it's been a driving factor in a lot of people, including a lot of music teachers now, um, because I'm at the age where my peers are actually, you know, working in schools, which is um, both terrifying and very cool. Uh, but they're a lot of those were driven by those community experiences, either in high school or in university, sort of guiding them towards like, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, so from that perspective, I think that's a part of music education. But I want to know for you, why do you, what's, in, what makes music education important, either personally or just, you know, societally? Okay, so let's, let's talk, talk about music education writ large, thinking about from school to university, like early school experiences, church experiences, um, everybody is going to find something that is going to be their passion. And recently in the pandemic, we here in Nova Scotia had to advocate very hard to put music back in the schools. So picture this, in Nova Scotia for the last six months or so, Kids could wear a mask, walk into a gymnasium, take it off, and run around with no mask on, um, with no limits or gathering sizes or anything like that. But kids were not allowed to get together in music rooms with masks on and sing or play musical instruments. Um, and the reasoning that we heard from everybody at that time was uh, that that being part of athletics is good for, for um, a student's mental well-being. And I just want to say for the record that not all of us found our joy on a sports team, that many of us found our joy in, in the sharing of musical ideas, of trying not to win a game, but to make something beautiful come out at the end of a choir rehearsal or, or the, the end of a trumpet bell when, when you know, it's, it's just an inanimate piece of metal, but somehow you're going to make something beautiful come out of the end of that. That is an important incredibly important process and procedure and I think in my mind it's it's actually more valid than than the the team analogy that comes from athletics um, once again I, I keep on referring to my father because I kept on doing stuff he didn't want he was the hockey guy and I kept quitting the sports and all those things on my way through because I found something for me much more meaningful through the musical ensembles that I got to perform in. And that, is, I think, is the other thing that is really important right now. The ensemble is a magical place where groups of people can do things collectively that individually we couldn't imagine doing on our own. And and I think that that idea of music education is incredibly valid. And personally, I think the wind band is one of the best music delivery systems you're ever going to run into. I don't know if I ever thought 30 plus years into my career that I'd be still fighting as hard, even at the university level, for the presence of what I do within the, the schooling that takes place. But um, there is an advocacy piece that all of us has to embrace in choosing to work in the arts. And um, that doesn't mean we don't change and evolve and grow with whatever is going on, but it also means that we have to justify our existence over and over again to administrators, to um, other musicians, you know, for the ways that we, we make music and share music together. And I've, I've learned that that is definitely part of the job in every level that I've managed to be lucky enough to serve in the music education field. Yes, I have found the same thing. Um... And in a very small microcosm. Your comments about advocacy follow really nicely into my next question, which is, do you have any advice to young people or young musicians interested in sort of your either, you know, playing trumpet or become working in music education or having that sort of broad career? You know, I think the activity of being engaged as a musician um, 
it consumes so much of our lives. When we're players, we're learning scales, we're learning excerpts, we're learning rep. When we're, when we're conductors, we're consuming scores, we're doing all of these things. Um, I read a, a, a slender volume, uh, a small book about a decade ago that kind of crystallized so many things of what I, I wish I had been thinking as I was working my way through the, um, the teaching and, and leadership elements of, of my career. And it's a book by a guy named Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, and it's called Start With Why. And I was always excellent when, in meetings at telling people what it was I did and how I was going to do it. But what they really needed to hear from me was why I was doing it in the first place. And in fact, I, I would often put that last in my presentations. And now in the work that I do when I'm, um, when I'm teaching, when I'm leading ensembles, I try to make sure I can answer the question why and put it front and foremost in my descriptions of why music education is important, why um, we need to schedule this this way. Why I, I make sure that the thing I lead with is, is the word why or the concept of why this is important. And um, I find that people respond more to that sort of passionate you know, self-knowledge that I bring, the, 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 my passion for this is here because of this, this, and this. And I tell them how and what later. But starting with why is, is incredibly important, I think, for teachers, for musicians, for musical leaders. That's definitely, that's also just good generally in broad life advice if you're trying to articulate things. Um, I know that that's something that I think has carried through on a lot of, like, the work I've gotten to do is like, I need to, uh, to probably to an over explaining <laughs> occasional extent. Um, but it's been that sort of start with, this is what, th this is the motivation for this. And this is how it's going to happen because you have, there is a, uh, you have to uh, get them on board. You have to show someone, this is why I'm doing this. So, um, I guess I'm just reiterating the thing you said, but I think well, it's well, really, it's I think it's a valuable thing. It's interesting. When, when I was a kid, that we were told what to do. We weren't told why. Yeah. Um, I don't think you could, you could exist in that autocratic way in the music field, the way that, that people did in the past. Um, I, I co-authored a paper with a political science prof here at Acadia um, comparing the dictators of the mid 20th century to the dictatorial conduct of conductors and musical leaders on the podium. It was fantastic. It was because there's a direct correlation to the rise of fascism in, in politics and the rise of the fascist state in the professional orchestra world. And those people could not survive today in the modern orchestral sense if, if no matter how great a musician they were, they would not get away with firing the first trumpet player on the spot. I don't know why I was thinking about firing the trumpet player, but you know, firing the first trumpet player on the spot in a rehearsal, like you don't do that. There's, there's, um, there's, a, there's no longer the sense that the, the people in the orchestra are, are like keys on a piano that you press down and that sound comes out. There's the understanding, and, and I think this understanding has always existed with the really great musicians that people love to work with, that um, you understand the person in the room and you encourage them to contribute their very best and you don't tell them everything to do, but you meet them halfway in, in that, that moment between the two. And I, and I find this is what I love about university music making, is you get a bunch of people who are paying for the privilege of being in that room. And therefore, they come with a hunger that is unlike anything you're going to get just about anywhere else. And that, that place of meeting is so incredibly rich and exciting. That's, that's the joy of working at the university level for me. Yeah. There's a reciprocity to those relationships that I think is yeah. really vibrant and is something that I've, has been a big, weirdly large part of my academic life and explorations, which has been really, um, which, you know, that's an aside, but it's something that I think is really valuable. And I like hearing it from people who are like, you know, teaching it because it's like, yes, yeah, some, that's not just my, uh, it's not just like my student experience. Um, so that's really awesome. Uh, and that asking why, explaining why is something that I've brought into the teaching that I do 
really aggressively <laughs> of like, so we're doing this because this, this, and this. And sometimes people look at you very blankly and go, okay, and don't really, and that's fine because they're children and it's okay. Um, but I want them to be 22 and going, oh, I do know why I'm doing that rather than my experience, which I love my music teachers all through my high school for a while, but I didn't really know why I was doing a lot of things until I was about 17. Um, yep. And then when I was like, I want to do this. And they're like, I guess I have to explain to you why you're doing all this. And I'm like, if we start that at a younger age, they might be more invested um, or at least more motivated. Um, but yeah. Sure. And, and you know, the other thing is, uh, even if you don't have to explain why, you'd better be able to explain why. Because yeah. if you're in a rehearsal with a group you don't know and someone puts up a hand and says, you know, I, you want to do that that way, I should be able to say yes, because I've noticed this, this and this and my understanding of the history of the you know, all those reasons that that I sweat over alone in a, in a small room <laughs> um, come to light and come to life when, when we walk into a room with real real musicians sitting in it. The um, I always tell my conducting students that the performance isn't when the lights go out and you walk out on stage in a suit. Your performance as, as, a, as a conductor is the first rehearsal. That's the performance for you. The rest of them get time before they get on stage, but we are on display from the first rehearsal we walk into. And again, that's that preparedness. I have to credit um, the legendary Frank Battisti uh, from New England Conservatory with, with driving home all of the messages I got through my master's degree and through all of the experiences I had with so many mentors. Um, Frank turned 90 not that long ago, which kind of blows my mind. And uh, I called him when we were talking, and honestly, he sounded more youthful than I felt that day. Like, he is just so full of energy and ideas, and he's, he's just moving forward in such a decisive way. Um, he's been a role model for me, and I'm so lucky to have been his assistant in New England Conservatory in Boston for a couple of years, and call him a friend now. You know, if I have a question, I can call up Frank, and I'll get an earful. It'll be fantastic. So... Uh, this is one of the great things about the profession, you know, that um, that we do make these friends and mentors who really do want to hear from us again. You know, it's not like we're one and done. It's 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 like we almost become a sort of a musical family in this field. And we keep running into each other in various cities and various places at various times. And it's it's kind of fantastic. Yeah, there's nobody I don't have like two a degree I've interviewed that I haven't sort of managed to find a one or two degree of separation from no matter what I do. I'm like, oh, you know, this person. Well, I know this person who is married to that person. So we have um, or I studied with one of your teachers because music careers can be very long and you can have these generational things, which are very cool. Um, so it, that's uh, the sort of beauty of the sort of job that you end up doing. Um, our last thing before we wrap up is our super fast five sort of rapid fire fun questions to sort uh -oh. of, you know, quiet energy. They're very straightforward. Um, you can answer them as quickly or as uh, effusively as you want, but they are called the fast five. Um, so are you ready? Uh Oh, okay. Hang on. All right. Okay. Question one, favorite movie soundtrack. Back in the uh, late 1980s, there was a movie about the environment that came out called Koyaanisqatsi. Koyaanisqatsi. And um, it included music by Philip Glass. And it was right about the moment when minimalism was bursting like a wave upon sort of the music scene. I mean, it had been going on before, but it seemed to hit popular consciousness right about then. And uh, you're far too young to know this, but composers, forgive me for saying this, but composers in the generation when I was young were, were if you wanted to write in a tonality, you were told not to do that. And it's kind of like we went from the serial technique school of teaching composition um, with, with a de-emphasis of tonality to uber ton tonality, if you know what I mean. Like, a, the, so Philip Glass came along and Koyana Scotsi was, so beautiful and, and so picturesque. And then there was a movie called The Hours, um, where he wrote the soundtrack and played piano on it. And I got to go and see him perform this in Calgary. And I bought a front row seat because I wanted to be so close because I wanted to, to see and hear him perform this music. And what I loved about that performance 
was he, and so, for, so much for the Fast Five, sorry, but but when he played, um, like all minimalist textures, he did something over and over again for a very long time, and just before the one element changed in the next part of the pattern, he would put just this little bit of rubato in before the change, and that, that seemed to be antithetical to the idea of repetitions and upon repetition, but it, it, it gave me great hope, <laughs> you know, that, that what musical expression is, has been what musical expression has been since before we had recorded music, and it will be going forward, that there is a, a place for the music to breathe and for that sort of humanity to creep in. It was nice. Yeah. No, that's very cool, especially because Philip Glass, of all of many of them, is one of the more continuous momentum um, minimalists, uh, uh, and one of my I enjoy listening to Philip Glass quite a lot. Um, question two on the Fast Five: Instrument you wish you played? Double bass, and I actually took lessons. That's great. That's the only time I've ever heard someone say double bass. That's that's cool. Question three: What's your hidden talent? If you have one, if so, what is it? I could very easily go to a cordon bleu school and and cook for a living. I I love cooking, crazy. I do all the cooking in my house. Anybody comes to my you come to my house, I cook for you. And um, it's it's weird. I don't know that it's a talent, um, but it does seem to to make sense that they you know the the French version of conductor is chef d'orchestre. You know, take a little bit of this, put it, you know, I'm looking yeah. for that perfect blend, that perfectly balanced thing all the time. So uh, I, I think I like the fact it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very cool. I love, I wish I could cook better than I can. I have very limited palate um, when it comes to cooking. And that's, I'd like to work on that. And strangely, the last two years of the pandemic has not helped, um, ironically. <laughs> um, question four. This doesn't have to be, name one of the favorite concerts you've attended. Bruckner for Chicago Symphony, 1985. First time I heard the Chicago Symphony live and in person. Klaus Tenstedt was conducting, and it was breathtaking. Although the glorious brass section were, were in fine form at the height of their powers. Jacob was playing tuba. It was... Kleinhammer on trombone, on bass trombone, it was marvelous, beyond marvelous. Clevenger was playing, Larry Coombs was playing clarinet. I mean, it was it was the band that, that was kind of maybe the, the best woodwind brass percussion section in the world. Maybe still is, but man, it was certainly then. I love Bruckner, so I'm very envious of that show. Uh, I watched the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra do, I think it was nine? Oh, I've forgotten which one it was. Uh, and I sat there and the person beside me was like, why are we going to listen to 45 minutes of this thing? And I was like, well, just watch. And then it happened. And they were like, I understand why you like him so much. And I was like, uh-huh. Um, he's wonderful. He's one of my favorites. Last Fast Five question. Um, it's the most pandemic-related question. What is the favorite piece? What What is the last show you binge watched? or the last movie series you watched, or the last book collection, book series, books you like devoured. Not everyone watches TV, so I want to be as broad as possible. Um, it's sad to say I have been binging all kinds of things during the, uh, the pandemic. The, the most recent thing we finished, and this was really fun, um, we went to CBC Gem and we watched Ghosts, which is hilarious. Um, the British version, and then there's a North American version. So we'd watch episodes in both versions and watch how the narrative and the characters drove each of those things in different directions. Um, in terms of reading, I'm a voracious biography reader, and um, but recently I've been going back to my my compulsion. I, I probably own more books by and about regarding Stravinsky and uh, Diaghilev and that, that very fertile period that created the symphonies of wind instruments than anybody else in the country. Um, and I've got more on order. And uh, it's, 
it's um, all leading me back around again to, to trying to make sense out of it, that work, which in and of itself is enig enigmatic, really difficult to understand, and doesn't have the proper place in, in the literature. So the series is Ghosts, but the books are, I'm rereading re everything and, and reading new material about Stravinsky, looking to, to publish on him very soon, on that piece. That's that a very, very different sort of topics. Um, I have heard about ghosts and I haven't actually, it's been on my, like, I should watch this um, list. So it's very cool to get more good feedback. I think Mark Hamill, the uh, Star Wars guy from Star Wars likes ghosts. I remember really? something about that. Yeah. Weird. Um, the guy from Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, as if he's like, not a, he's a guy. He's just a guy. Just a dude. Uh, just a random dude. Um, but thank you so much for speaking with me today. Uh, before we go, uh, do you have any sort of exciting plans or projects coming up? Anything you're like excited to share about, you know, what you're doing at Acadia or like outside of that? Actually, um, a number of projects in, in the works right now. So uh, I've had a little bit of extra time on my hands for the last few weeks. And in that time, we've actually managed to go from concept to launching the first national junior high aged honor band that is going to be an online experience. It's being led by Cheryl Ferguson and Daryl Ferguson from Winnipeg, who are the dynamic duo, I think, of working with that age group. And it's been fun for me because it started in a meeting three weeks ago where I was worried about that group of students right now at junior high who don't have any really concrete ways to believe that that being in music is is exciting and meaningful to them and from there with a with a number of people through music fest canada we're we're launching this national junior honor band and it's accepting nominations from teachers right now and it's going like mad and it's really fun so i'm excited very excited about that project also uh muscan the um the University Music Society in Canada is doing a hybrid conference at my university, and we're going to perform John Astacio's I Lost My Talk, and uh, we're going to have um, Rita Joe's daughter in, in the audience. Rita Joe wrote the poem, I Lost My Talk. Um, I did the transcription um, three years ago or so and, and performed it with the National Youth Band of Canada. And uh, we're going to pull in members of the Staticona Band of the Royal Canadian Navy. We're going to do this performance in June. And that's really exciting. And then three days later, I get to go to New England, to the New England Conservatory. And I get to be a part of a performance for the 50th anniversary of the New England Conservatory Wind Ensemble with my mentor, Frank Battisti. And so I'm lucky. My life is very busy and very rich right now with actual in-person music to, to look forward to and online music making with great people. That's all sounds really cool, especially the bit about uh, the Youth Honor Band from like where we stand at Bandology and also me personally, that sounds like a really fascinating project. And I also want to go to that concert. I can't, but I would love to go to that concert. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you guys for watching. I've been Sandy Wright, Education Manager at Bandology, talking to Mark Hopkins. Uh, we do stuff every Monday and Thursday. What's Your Forte Season 3 is still coming out. Season 4 will come out in the next little bit. Thank you so much um, for listening and have a great evening. Thank you, Sandy. This was really fun. And thanks for the work you're doing with Bandology. It's exciting. Thank you for coming on and speaking to us. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy and research, and our play a gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performance, and interviews on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.